Greetings from Nashville, Tennessee. My name is Jonathan Yedkin. I am a studio musician here in Nashville. And my buddy Mike at iFiddle Magazine has asked if I would do a nice presentation for you today. And it's a beautiful June day here in Tennessee. Great day to make fiddle music. So let's start. Let's talk about violins. Let's talk about music. Let's talk about, in this case today, a hornpipe, one of my favorite styles. Um, this violin is a French violin, which I found in a little French violin shop across from Notre Dame on the Seine in Paris. It was a wonderful day. I love finding things like that. The shop was tucked away in an alcove. could barely see it. You were just able to see the violin sign for the luthier shop. I walked in. We barely spoke uh, each other's languages enough, but I was able to tell the owner that I liked uh, for, uh, Carissa Francais violins, which are a student-level French violin, 80, 100 years old. Uh, not very valuable, but they sound really nice. Um, I like French violins a lot. Uh, we'll talk about other violins in a few. Uh, in this case, he pulled out this lovely little instrument, which has absolutely no name at all. It looks like it may have been worked on about 100 years ago. It's a little bit of work look on the back. But because it has absolutely no name and no tag, it has no resale value. So he wasn't interested in a lot of money. I love the sound of it. I just thought it had a... <laughs> One great way uh, for me to judge an instrument right off the bat is to get that um, uh, A note on the E string. Does it light up the room? Does it light up the instrument? I think it does. If you got that, and the same thing with the, uh, the D note on the A. G note on the D. That the entire instrument resonates with those notes, you're off to a good start. Uh, of course, the harmonics. But always, if you just pick up a violin and you get that... Oh, I'm there. I'm already sold. So this is um, a wonderful old no-name French violin, which I'll be using today. And we will have a look at the Sheffield Hornpipe. A hornpipe is a type of tune from the British Isles, as I'm sure you know. In this case... The Sheffield Hornpipe, I love reading what they put in the book. They say, The town of Sheffield is populous and large. The streets narrow, the houses dark and black, occasioned by the continued smoke of the forges. Here they make all sorts of cutlery ware, but especially that of edged tools, knives, razors, and axes. Uh, this is from the 1720s, so I'm sure it's a little bit different in Sheffield now. But um, it's a lovely description. And it says, this tune is a catchy and simple hornpipe. It goes not too fast and jauntily. The accent falls on the first and third beats of each bar. I hope that the uh, picture of the music is included so you can see this. And we will look at it slowly at first. It has two parts, as do most hornpipes. The A section and the B section each get repeated. So at a slow tempo, this would be the Sheffield hornpipe. Um, I am using a, a strobe tuner, by the way, which I like. It, it displays four frequency bands of information for you to judge your tuning by. Strobe tuners pick up a lot of overtones and give you the largest display of the note that you can tune to. It's really nice. And they're not terribly expensive anymore. They used to be. They used to have those uh, turning wheels inside, but now they're digital. And they don't. They even make a stomp box strobe tuner, which uh, Peterson makes. It's very nice. Uh, so this is the Sheffield Hornpipe. It's in the key of D, two sharps on the music. <laughs> I would say a tempo about a one, and a two, and a three, and a four.
understand. Uh, we could do it a little bit faster with a little bit more jaunt to it. We could examine the first and third beats of each measure for accents. In other words, that would be like this. But you don't want to be too accentive, if that's a word, on this kind of thing. So you probably have to dial it back a little bit. second part, it would work just as well. A little faster might make it interesting. Let's see what happens. I'd say that's too fast. Let's back it down a little bit. What if we took it down really slow and made it even more romantic? It'd become a different tune, wouldn't it? There's a couple things you could do if you were in performance and you wanted to make this piece your own, so to speak. When you got to the, um, let's see, uh, first section we would leave the same. Second section, when we get to uh, this part. Let's say you're getting to the end of your performance of this piece and you want to do something a little extra. Let's add a little bit more to that. Uh, it would be uh, one, two, three, the fourth bar. Uh, so we added a bar. Uh, actually, we added half a bar. Um, to make it a little more exciting and fun. You've played it through three times, and now you get to this B section. Just something to add to it. Make it unique. Same thing at the very end of the song. You could do the same thing in those last two bars. You could change it to... So... The extended B section for the end of your performance could be uh, just something to make it a little more special and unique for yourself. So we have the Sheffield Hornpipe. There are so many kinds of music to be able to play violin to examine them all. Find what really makes you incredibly happy because you're going to want to play it over and over and over again. So Mike has sent me a couple of questions to answer and I have them up behind you, <laughs> behind me. Um, so I'm going to read these little questions and answer them as quickly as I can. Uh, he says that I know your parents were classical musicians did they have a lot of influence on you as a young musician? Of course they did. Uh, my siblings as well, who are musicians, 
all of these people have influences on you. Uh, in my case, my parents were very supportive of any kind of music, even though they did want to see me go into classical violin work. When they realized that it was a passion to pursue other kinds of violin work, they did not stand in the way. They gave me good support, which is what I will try, of course, to do in turn with uh, any of my children. Um, yes, they did. Uh, their influences were uh, religious music and show tunes, but you'd be amazed at how much that information comes into play just when you need it. Uh, I'm a uh, violinist fiddle. Do I still practice? How much do I practice? At this point, I work constantly in the studio. I also float between about 25 different instruments. I love all stringed instruments, mandolins, violins, violas, cellos. Cellos are the greatest. Cellos, you hold them. It's like holding a beautiful woman against you. It's the wonderful thing in the world. Uh, I highly recommend any violin player to learn cello. Uh, it really brings something nice to the party. Um, when I get ready to work, I have a warm-up period. And I make sure that, you know, it's kind of a... Not quite a Zen thing, but you find your place, you do some nice breathing, you get into some long, even long one octave scales, just to acclimate yourself to what you're about to do. You just don't want to jump in cold. Singers don't jump in cold. If they do, they take a chance on blowing their voice. Uh, with the stringed instruments, give yourself a chance. Warm into it, even if it's just a few scales. Uh, but as far as practicing, uh, my practice is my work. So I don't really have the time to set aside to practice. And even if I'm practicing, uh, which I do sometimes, I, half the time I end up turning on the recording machine because I want to record something. Um, so that answers that question. I do believe in practicing. I think it's a very important part of what you do. Um, I just enjoy playing. <laughs> as soon as I start practicing, I have to start playing. So it should all be intertwined. Um, is there one event that changed my life in regard to music? They all do. There really isn't one thing. I remember seeing Yitzhak Perlman in performance when I was about seven years old, which left uh, an incredible impression. I also saw Jack Benny in performance when I was about six years old, which also left a great performance. He, Look at these people. Look at what their joy is from their instrument. Uh, let that be a good guide for you. Um, do I enjoy other genres of music? Of course I do. Uh, to close your mind to the rest of the world's music isn't fair. It just isn't fair to you. I know there's a lot of people who only listen to one kind of thing. Okay. If that's what makes you happy. What makes me happy is finding new kinds of music. I think I had mentioned Portuguese fado and salsa and klezmer. These are all wonderful forms of music. They all come with a story, a background, a taste of culture. And if you go to these places, if you go to Portugal and, and listen to somebody play fado music, which is the uh, indigenous folk music of Portugal, you're drawn in. You want to know. You have to know. And so you learn. Learning is the most important thing to being a musician. Uh, it must be hard doing what you're doing. What are some of the challenges getting into the field of being a studio musician? Being here, uh, one thing about Nashville, which makes so many musicians come and stay, is that there is a lot of recording going on. And you simply have to be here a while. Uh, the Nashville recording situation is made it's it's based in trust you trust the people that you bring in you trust the uh producers you trust yourself everybody pulls together in a ball team consciousness so to speak to get the job done we want to get the job done we want to play live we want to play together uh, we want to work off each other and if at all possible we want to get a performance take which is where everybody's playing at the same time you, you do a performance uh, it's simply in a studio and not on the stage and that's how you get your best results, is you get the magic of playing together. Um, is there a difference between skill and talent as a musician? It's a good question, Mike. 
yes and no. Talent is important. You can be born with talent, but you can develop a skill. Someone once said 10,000 hours of practice will make anyone a virtuoso in anything. And I include power tools in that, um, chess and skydiving. Okay, if you devote enough time to it to develop your skill, you can uh, be as effective as anybody born with talent. Uh, and in the same way, a lot of people are born with talent who don't know how to develop or don't want to take the time to develop the skill. So, yes, there is a difference. It's nice when they go hand in hand, but they don't always. Um, how do you balance music, family, and other obligations? Well, it's called time management. And get used to it. You have to. Uh, in order to, as with any business, you have to make sure that you allot uh, an equal amount of time for making a living as you do for paying attention to your family and your other interests. Uh, do, 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 who are my musical heroes? So many of them. So many of them. Um, early on, my heroes were people like uh, Walter Carlos, who created uh, entire orchestras by himself on synthesizers in the late 60s and early 70s with things like Switched on Bach and the Clockwork Orange music. Um, he was doing it, um, uh, Paul Buckmaster was doing that with cello in, uh, with the early Elton John music. Uh, they were great inspirations for me. Uh, of course, people like Stefan Grappelli, um, great jazz musicians like the, oh, the recently, uh, passed, uh, Horace Silver, uh, the King, long live the King. Um, seeing people, uh, makes you, uh, take them on as, as heroes, seeing McCoy Tyner perform, seeing Jeff Beck perform. Uh, these are great things to inspire and, and let you know that, uh, most importantly, there really isn't an age limit to a lot of these things. You know, seeing McCoy Tyner perform in his seventies is like, okay. You know? Or the fact that Jeff Beck three years ago is better than I ever remember him as being, uh, he's continually learning and mastering that craft of guitar. Uh, what do I like most about my profession? Uh, what I like most is that it is my passion. And if you can create a profession out of your passion, you're way ahead of the game. Uh, I highly recommend it for anybody. Even if you're passionate about chemical engineering, be a chemical engineer. You're going to be a happy guy. What do I do when I'm not working? Mm. Mostly read. I love reading. I am a book addict. I love used books. <laughs> but um, I have no problem with the, with new books. Uh, I've kind of shifted mostly over to paperbacks because if I fall asleep reading, I don't like to clunk myself in the head with a hardback. Um, but reading it opens up the mind. And reading as much as you possibly can can only add to all kinds of... Uh, of uh, additions to your repertoire, of, of things to think about, uh, ideas to get. Uh, as a studio musician, you want ideas. You have to amass all the music you can into your brain so that it jumps right out when you need it. And reading acts as a catalyst to accessing those synopsis and things like that in your brain. Uh, and I enjoy scuba diving, even though it's rather expensive and you can't do it all the time. Uh, da, 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 uh, what kind of violin do I play? I play the kind of violin that sounds good. Um, I have uh, my main uh, violin for the studio is is called a Reidel, R-E-I-D-E-L. It's a German instrument, and it was uh, co-created by uh, a guy here in Nashville named Fred Carpenter, who understood the needs of the studio violin player. Fortunately, they were not that expensive, and if you ever see a Reidel violin. They're made to look antique, even though they're not very old. I don't know if they're still making them. I really like that one. Uh, the Caressa Francais, I think I mentioned before. The new name, French violin. Uh, a couple of Italians, a couple of German violins, and an amazing $300 Chinese violin. I don't have anything that I consider very expensive. Um, 
I've never felt the need. I've always found a lot of joy in moderately priced instruments. Uh, and that goes for all the instruments that I play. Uh, guitars, mando cellos, banjos, they're out there. Go find them. Um, strings, I am not terribly loyal in the string department. I kind of shift from one pack to another um, and just see how they feel. If they don't feel good, I take them off. Um, okay, so maybe I'm not using black diamond strings. Uh, the whole Diodario line is very useful uh, for me because I play so many instruments and they have just about every string in the world. So I would kind of say if it's on the Diodario list, uh, check it out. They're there. And where do I see myself in five years? Good question, Mike. I started doing movie soundtracks by myself, uh, creating the entire orchestra by myself. And uh, I've got three done so far and out and released. So I want to continue uh, the Nashville recording scene, but I really like doing movie soundtracks. Uh, it's extremely enjoyable. Uh, I'm a bit of a control freak when it comes to that. So being able to do everything by myself is a lot of fun. And finally, um, put your ideas into someone's tune. This was a good question about being a studio musician. How do you put your ideas into someone's tune without overdoing it? Uh, remember, when you're a studio musician, you're not necessarily there to impress. You're there to help the song. Help the song. Do the right thing. It may require a little. It may require a lot. But examining the song, examining the words, it's very important to listen to what the words are. You know, the, the tune may have a jaunty little beat, but if the words are something about, um, you know, the funeral of your favorite dog, you don't want to play happy. You want to balance things out. Uh, artists and producers really like it when you take the time to examine what's going on in a song before you just start jumping into it. Um, so you want to present. I call it a serving suggestion. You know, I say, well, how about a little bit of this? References are great to use. Would you like to hear a little old Glenn Campbell influences? Would you like to hear something from the Ray Price era? Do you want something more along the lines of Newgrass Revival? Ask. And if they say, I don't know, then you start presenting ideas. But you know, there's no need to, to jump into the fray and just, uh, you know, take your time. Uh, it's not about you when you're a studio musician. It's about the artist you're working for. You have to be respectful of that. So don't get too far ahead of yourself and scare your artist and producer. Even though you may be very competent and accomplished and have licks out the wazoo to play. Be patient. See what happens. Uh, I think I've probably used up way too much time. And thank you, Mike, for this opportunity. And maybe we'll do some more. I have some stuff up on iTunes. Uh, I have stuff in the movies and um, all kinds of country records that I've enjoyed working on. Thank you for your time and enjoy the violin.